Hiya folks, it's Kikoskia here, and welcome back to ZMing and me. This video contains no gameplay or music whatsoever, allowing you to focus on whatever it is you're up to, whether it's designing a campaign, helping people stat up characters, fleshing out a town, looking at the stats of an NPC, or working out how the next combat encounter will go. And that is what we're going to be talking about today combat encounters and how to run them, and we're going to be using one particular iconic D&D monster to set out our examples. And that's right, we're going to be talking about dragons. Now when I mention dragons, a very specific image has come into your head, I'm sure. It is of a terrifying winged creature that is swooping over a castle, breathing fire, causing chaos and mayhem. A mighty foe that some people will believe is undefeatable, but not you. You're an adventurer. You know that this thing can be killed. You've quested long and hard to get the MacGuffin Sword, and you know that that thing can pierce its scaly hide. All you need to do is confront it. But that is far easier said than done. There are many steps that go towards encountering a dragon, and the dragon has set in place many steps of its own to make sure that never happens. But let's start from the very beginning, with a question that you may not think would be the first one. Is this dragon in a pre-written campaign? If the answer is yes, congratulations, most of the hard work has already been done for you, because the encounter will have already been set out. There will be the stat block for the dragon, there will be the personality of the dragon, the strategy of the dragon, all of this will be there for you. That said, the strategy of the dragon will very quickly change, dependent upon what the player characters do. And the player character strategies that they've set out to deal with the dragon will also inevitably change after the first round of combat with the dragon, because combats are really good at destroying well laid out plans. You then have to adapt what you're doing, and the dragon's adapting what it's doing, and before you know it, you are organically coming up with the strategy of your opponent without even thinking about it, but we are getting a little bit ahead of ourselves. How do we determine how the dragon is going to act? Well, we have to ask a few questions about the dragon, namely, what is the dragon capable of? What I mean by that is, what is the dragon's stat block? What are its abilities? And what has it experienced before? Let's tackle the first one, the stat block. In 3.5 D&D, the uh, version of D&D I'm most familiar with and will be referencing, dragons are typically both very intelligent and very wise. Even the least intelligent dragon, which is the worm white dragon, has intelligence 9, which puts them just a little bit below an average human, and as they grow older, they only grow smarter and more knowledgeable about all manner of things in the world. They gain tons of knowledge skills, and they have a lot of life experience, because dragons live for an exceptionally long time, thousands and thousands of years those thousands of years will mould their perception of the world, and it will teach them many things about how to deal with would-be interlopers, because, being dragons, someone is going to try and attack them at some point. Whether it's an adventuring party seeking to rid the land of the evil tyrant that demands tribute from the surrounding settlements, or a group of poachers seeking to steal a dragon egg so that they can sell it on the black market. Or maybe it's somebody that covets a very particular artifact that is in the dragon's hoard. And then there are monsters that will enter into the dragon's territory and try and claim their lair as their own, and all manner of other different encounters. Suffice to say, the dragon has experienced a lot of things, and you need to keep that in mind with what they're going to do to deal with an interloper. Say we have an average-aged red dragon. Red dragons are very smart, very wise, very proud, and very confident in their own abilities. Their default combat strategy says that they make a snap judgement as to whether they're going to engage in combat or not. If they do, they swoop over, breathe fire, and do all they can to obliterate their opponents utterly. If not, they will instead try to intimidate their opponents into giving them what they want. 
and then often attack them afterwards, likely knowing that the item that they've just received from the people that they've intimidated was the only thing that stopped those people from killing it. But that is just a generic strategy. It will be tweaked by the unique personality of the dragon. Every single thing that you encounter in any tabletop role-playing game is unique. Every animal that you encounter is unique. Every intelligent creature that you encounter is unique. And they will have their own way of doing things. Take this dragon. This dragon is a very paranoid dragon, I've decided, and has had a few very close calls with adventurers in the past. You can see on its body the scars of many previous encounters, where magical swords have pierced its hide and spells have blasted it. It doesn't want to have another encounter, so this dragon is going to uh, play the defensive game. And by that I mean getting to the dragon is going to be a challenge in and of itself. This dragon is going to use its smarts and its wiles and its knowledge of the land you've decided to uh, find a very secure hiding spot. A hiding spot that it is not going to tell anyone. Some foes will choose to have an army of underlings to help them defend their home, and also do things for them, but not this dragon. This dragon works alone. This dragon has found a long extinct volcano and a series of old caves within it that once housed an ancient troglodyte civilization. The troglodytes are long gone, but the cavernous, ancient, crumbling city is still there, and that place is big enough to house the dragon and its horde. So that is where the dragon makes its home, but not in the main cave. It actually makes its home in a secret cave that is concealed with illusions. There it can silently watch through the translucent magical fake wall at anything that decides to come and go, because it is an ancient civilization and sometimes people do decide to explore it. Now, this dragon is going to sit there with its horde, and there are going to be traps all over the place. Again, paranoid. Gotta remember it's paranoid. And with that in mind, we're gonna tweak its skills a little bit. It is going to have a lot of sense motive, because it needs to know, if it does end up in a conversation, whether the person is lying or not. And with that in mind, we're also gonna give it a lot of gather information too. Very rarely this dragon will go out and get knowledge about what's going on in the world. And it makes doubly sure that this information is right. By natural extension, we're going to now give it lots of knowledge skills so that it is well versed in the geography of the land, the various cities that are around, and all manner of other things. And also more spellcraft than usual, because it's that paranoid that it needs to know, without fail, every spell that's being cast near it, provided of course you can see. So what we have now is we have, before we've even got to a combat strategy, we have got this paranoid dragon with loads of scars that doubts everything and looks at every single person it encounters with suspicion. It is hiding behind an illusionary wall. It has all of this treasure that it so jealously guards because it knows, it knows, even if it's not true, it knows that every single person that comes to this civilization is after its horde and it. And it doesn't want to give up that horde. It doesn't want to give up a single coin. But what happens if this dragon has to get into combat? What if an adventuring party manages to find this ancient civilization? What if it manages to get past all of the traps? What if it discovers the illusionary wall and sees through it, or dispels it and finds the dragon? What happens then? That depends very much on what the objective of the opponent is. In this case, the dragon wants to make sure that nobody hurts it, that nobody takes its hoard, and that nobody knows that it's there. So, it's probably going to attack immediately. In fact, it would probably attack before the adventurers had even dispelled the illusionary wall, the 
best kind of attack is one that comes out of nowhere. And most people are not prepared to take on a massive blast of fire that comes out of what seems to be a perfectly solid wall. And as soon as that fire has been blasted forth, the dragon is going to swoop out of its cave and take to the air, because this dragon is smart, this dragon is wily, this dragon knows that most adventurers have a lot of difficulty dealing with enemies that are in the air, and even if they have the ability to get into the air, that takes time to prep. You need to cast spells that allow you to fly, or activate items that let you fly, and these actions take valuable seconds, seconds that this dragon can use to its advantage. So it's took to the air, and it assesses the situation from its lofty vantage point. All of the hired help that the adventurers brought with them have succumbed to the fire, but the adventurers haven't. One of them appears to be quite badly wounded, dressed in robes, has a staff, probably a wizard, and the rest of them are not as bad. One person is entirely unharmed. Dragon looks at that, immediately thinks, must have something that protects them from fire. Right. Don't worry about targeting that person with fire breath. I can't do it for a while anyway. I have other things, though. The dragon is going to look at all of them and determine which one is the most dangerous. Some enemies will be very straightforward in their combat strategy. They will charge forward, they will keep attacking the closest foe until either they perish or the foe perishes, whereupon they'll move on to the next one. But not this dragon. Not Isgran. Isgran is going to pick out the most dangerous foe. And in this instance, it is a foe that can fly. There is a man clad in armor, wielding a lance, and riding a griffin. And that is the dragon's first target. Not the warrior, the griffin. Because without the griffin, that lance isn't going to be very useful. And wouldn't you know it, the dragon has the perfect thing to deal with that griffin. Not swooping down, because swooping down at the moment would give the uh, adventurers a chance to attack. No. Magic. The dragon has magic, and the perfect spell to try and deal with that creature. It fires the spell. The griffin is unable to resist the spell, and slumps asleep. Not dead. Asleep. The dragon went for the one that was more likely to succeed. Could very well have tried to kill the griffin with the spell, but why do that when you can set it to sleep and then have the adventurers waste valuable time trying to rouse the griffin? That's all that the uh, dragon can do at that point. So the dragon is in the air, it's cast this spell, set the griffin to sleep, now it's the adventurers. The adventurers take stock. They see this dragon in the air. They were not prepared for this dragon. They were instead prepared for the Medusas that are believed to be in the Troglodyte city. There aren't any Medusas in the Troglodyte city. That is a false rumor that the uh, dragon has spread so that people will come preparing for the wrong thing. Now the adventurers act. One of the party gets out a bow. Dragon realizes this. That's a target it needs to deal with quite quickly. The one with the robes casts a spell. A beam of concentrated frost that strikes the dragon in the side and hurts quite a bit. Dragon's changed focus now. That is the most dangerous target. As for the knight, the knight is trying to rouse the griffin. That is time wasted. And the other warrior that is entirely unharmed mutters something and then suddenly takes to the air. Oh, that's also a significant threat. So a dragon has a problem now. There is a wizard who knows its vulnerability to cold. There is an archer who is uh, readying a shot. Curious as to why it hasn't actually fired yet. But still dangerous. And there is a warrior that can fly. These people are more dangerous than it first suspected. Gonna have to think carefully about this. Ah, that'll do it. That'll do it! So, the dragon swoops a little bit further away, flings another spell. A spell that creates a big cloud of poisonous acidic gas. 
centered on the party. This is not designed to kill them, it's designed to distract them, it's designed to scatter them, and it works. The warrior with the lance is forced to abandon the griffin and flees out of the cloud, as does the wizard and the archer. The warrior that can fly is making a beeline for the dragon, though. Very bold, very brave, but also very stupid, because one-on-one -on -one against the dragon, that warrior is in trouble. Arrows fly forth from the bow. One of them manages to hit, but it pings harmlessly off the dragon's scales. The wizard decides to cast a spell on himself. A protective spell. Not a problem, a dragon's thinking. Not a problem. That foe that's getting close, though, that's a problem. But they made a terrible mistake. Because the dragon could swoop over and just strike at him, which it does. Flies by. Jaws ready. The warrior is about to swing, but it's no use. This dragon is too strong. This dragon is too mighty. And one chomp. And this warrior is gone. One down. Three to go. There's a cry of anger from the archer. The archer must have been really close to that warrior. Something to think about. But now the adventurers act. The wizard fires off another spell, another blast of cold. This one is even more painful than the last. It freezes the dragon's wings momentarily, makes it more difficult to fly. That is the next target. The archer is now unleashing arrow after arrow after arrow. One of them manages to hit where previous wounds haven't fully healed, past where the scales are weaker. That hurt as well, but not as much as the wizard. The dragon, using its wiles, knows that the wizard is terrible in close combat, but also knows that that warrior with the lance could still be a threat. That lance is probably not the only weapon the warrior has. So instead, the dragon goes for another blast of fire. Knowing now that the warrior who is completely resistant to fire is gone. This blast of fire was expected, but still, it was very effective. For when the flames die down, there is no more wizard. The wizard is just gone. And now, the strategy of the adventurers changes. The archer is trying to run, while the lance-wielding knight shouts forth a challenge, demanding that the dragon face it in single combat and fight honorably. The dragon is not going to do that. The dragon is going to make sure that nobody escapes. And that archer is trying to get away. And so, now, the dragon lands. The dragon lands right in front of the archer. And the archer knows fear. The archer knows terror. And it takes hold. The mere presence of this terrifying dragon, the frightful presence ability, kicks in exactly when it needs to. Panic grips the archer, who then tries to run the other way. The other person is entirely unaffected. Either... They're a person of incredible uh, willpower, or they're unable to feel fear. But that's okay. They're gonna get their wish of single combat, eventually. If only because this dragon has taken out everyone else. Speaking of that warrior, that warrior is going to drop the lance, draw the glowing sword, charges forward, tries the strike, doesn't manage to penetrate the dragon's side. Dragon is unconcerned by this foe, and moves to engage the fleeing archer. The knight strikes again, manages to get through the scales a bit, but only causes a slight stinging sensation. Not a threat. The archer, however, could reveal this dragon's location, and then other adventurers will come. The local lord may put out a bounty for the dragon's head. The dragon doesn't want this. The dragon definitely doesn't want this. And so the dragon moves past and swipes with the tail. The tail connects with the archer, smashing the archer into the wall, unconscious. Or dead. Doesn't matter. Dragon can deal with that one later. Turns its attention now to the one person left standing. The one clad in plate mail, the one wielding the glowing sword, who stands there defiant, and who keeps striking at the dragon's hide. And this is when the dragon breathes fire once more. 
There's nothing left of that one but ash when the fire abates. The dragon breathes a sigh of relief, looks back to its wounds. They're not terrible. They will heal in time. Nothing will scar. It goes over to the archer, dispatches that one with ease, crushing it against the wall with its claws, and then goes about collecting the loot. It detects which things are magical, adds them to its hoard, gets all the gold and adds that to the hoard, and then sets about making the place safe again. For the combat may be over for the dragon, but now it has to prepare for the next foe, because there will always be another foe. Traps need to be relayed. It has to figure out how the adventurers got in, and make sure that way is sealed. And it has to re-establish the illusionary wall that concealed its lair. And with that, the dragon has dispatched the adventurers. And that is something you should not be afraid to do with a tabletop role-playing encounter. Truly dangerous encounters, like dragons, liches, demons, and things that are designed to be capstones of certain arcs, or encounters that are generally near the end of a campaign. They are all dangerous. They are all meant to be a significant threat. And death could very well be a possibility. That said, you shouldn't have every encounter be one that is a life-or-death, you-will-die situation. At the beginning, this can occur just because adventurers are low-level, and getting hit even once can cause a significant amount of harm. But many encounters typically will not kill adventurers, but will rather wear down their resources. Hit points will be reduced, ammunition will be expended, and spells, offensive, defensive, and healing, will be expended. The more difficult these encounters are, the more of these will be used up. And also keep in mind how many of these things have been used up when the encounters occur. The dragon had an easier time of things because that adventuring party had not rested for quite a while. The adventuring party weren't prepared for a dragon, and they'd expended quite a few of their resources already. Some people were a little bit hurt. The wizard didn't have many spells left. They were just exploring around the area before they decided to rest, and then the dragon struck. But either way, the action there was intense, the suspense was there, and it's a truly memorable encounter that was built upon the personality of the opponent, the place that they were in, what things they'd set up beforehand, and what their ultimate goal was. The ultimate goal of that dragon was make sure that nobody figures out where I am, crush them completely, don't give them a chance, and it didn't. The dragon was smart enough, wise enough, had enough experience to know what opponents were the most dangerous threat, and thus reacted to it. Had that have been instead a group of orcs that were first level, they likely would not have had that level of stratagem. Compare the stratagem of a dragon to a wyvern. Wyverns are still intelligent, not anywhere near as intelligent as a dragon, and not anywhere near as well equipped to deal with foes as a dragon. They don't have spells, they can fly, they don't have a breath weapon. They do have a poisonous tail barb, though. So what they'll do is they'll make swooping flyby attacks, striking with the tail barb, uh, biting at foes if they end up getting uh, forced to the ground, and using their ability to keep distant and deal damage over time to their advantage. Any foes that can deal damage at range, they'll try and focus on them, and they will likely flee if they take too much damage, or if some of their numbers fall. They are intelligent. An unintelligent foe won't do that. An undead that is mindless and has been ordered to defend somewhere at all costs will stand their ground and defend up until its defeat, because it is mindless. It has no ability to employ a different strategy, it can only do what it was told. But I'm going to win this on a piece of advice that you have to take to heart with these encounters. Ultimately, this is about having fun. An encounter with a dragon is a truly epic and monumental moment. It's meant to be fraught with peril, and there is the very real chance that the heroes will die. But don't take this upon yourself to decide to be the destroyer of the adventurers, and 
unfairly engineer things so that the adventurers are at such a huge disadvantage that they have no chance of survival. Don't give the dragon advantages it cannot have. If the dragon doesn't know that they're coming and doesn't know their capabilities, don't engineer the dragon to purposefully give it abilities exclusively designed to mitigate the hero's advantages and exploit their vulnerabilities. This dragon is not tooled to be the kill this particular party monster. It's a dangerous threat, yes, but its purpose is not, I'm here to kill this party. This dragon is paranoid. This dragon doesn't want to be found. This dragon has set up traps. This dragon will strike without any warning. This dragon will try and prevent people from getting away. But this dragon is not going to fire a cone of cold immediately at the wizard who looks normal but is actually a fire elemental. That would be very unfair. You are using knowledge that you have but the dragon doesn't have. And that's going to spoil the encounter. Only use the knowledge that the dragon has, and make sure that the encounter is fun. Remember the ultimate rule. Make sure everyone's having fun. If that means fudging a roll or two, fudge a roll or two. The ultimate objective is to enjoy yourself, and to make that encounter a truly memorable one. I'm not saying make sure that the heroes win. The heroes can lose, and that does happen sometimes. But make sure it's enjoyable. And as long as it is, your players will remember that encounter for years to come. And with that, I think I've given all the advice that I can about making a memorable encounter. Specifically, with that paranoid dragon. And so, when we come back, folks, we'll talk about something else. It may not necessarily be about DMing, it could also be about writing. If there's anything you want me to talk about in particular, be sure to mention it in the comments. And I also want to say, before I go, that Chapter 7 of The Threnity of Dusseldom is now available to be read. If you want to check it out, go to uh, kikoskia.com forward slash Dusseldom, spelled D-U-S-T-L-E-D-O-M. Getting pretty good at saying that quite quickly. And so, I'll catch you next time, folks. And I'll see you then. Later.